I will now call the October 20th, 2020 regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Good morning. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Friend. Here. Coonerty. Here. McPherson. Uh, he Supervisor yes, McPherson, you're on mute. <laughs> Here. <laughs> Thank you. And Chair Caput. Here. We're going to have a moment of silence. I'm going to turn it over real quick to uh, Supervisor Leopold. And then we're going to follow with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, as we take this moment of silence, I'm asking you to remember uh, 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 the loss of a really important part uh, and a member of the SoCal community. Anna Salaskar uh, was a long uh, time teacher at SoCal Elementary School District. Uh, she taught both my daughters in the same classroom that she was a second grader in uh, when she was growing up here in SoCal. She was an active member of the SoCal Pioneers Group and she, she, she taught scores of children who passed through that school district. Um, she passed away just a couple of days ago, and I hope you remember when we take our moment of silence. Okay, uh, please join us for a uh, moment of silence and prayer and uh, a pledge of allegiance. Consideration of late additions uh, to the agenda, deletions to the consent or regular agenda. Good morning, Chair Caput and members of the board. We do have a number of revisions and corrections. On the regular agenda, item eight, there are additional materials. There's a revised attachment A, packet page 76, with clean and strikeout underlying copies. Item 10 on the reg regular agenda ha also has additional materials. There's a revised memo, packet page 82, with clean and strikeout underlying copies. On the consent agenda, item 18 has additional materials. There's a revised memo, packet page 107, with clean and strikeout underlying copies. Item 21 has additional materials. Revised memo, packet page 132, clean and strikeout underlying copies. There's also a revised attachment A packet pages 134, 135, and 136 with clean and strikeout underlying copies. We also have an addenda to the consent agenda. Item 23.1 reads, adopt resolution authorizing the County of Santa Cruz to participate in the California Secretary of State Help America Vote Act, CARES Act funding program, ratify revenue agreement with the California Secretary of State in the amount of $613,991 for HAVA section 101 activities to conduct the November 3rd, 2020 presidential general election and take related actions as recommended by the county clerk. Attached to this item is a board memo printout, a resolution and a state agreement. Additional materials are also included, attachment C, ADM 29. Um, item 47.1 is also on the agenda. It reads, approve agreement with Wayfinder Family Services in the amount not to exceed $162,000 for kinship support services and take related actions as recommended by the Director of Human Services. Attached to the item are the board memo printout, contract, the contract and the ADM 29, and that's all. Okay. And uh, do uh, any board members uh, uh, wish to pull a consent item or uh, make a comment now? Comment now? No, I think you want to ask if uh, if it's uh, if we're going to pool anything, right? Because we, we usually do comments after the oral communications. After. Yeah. Okay. 
So uh, uh, I'm not, I, I might pull item number 32 to give some recognition to the uh, uh, Costanoan Ohlone Rumson Mutsen tribe, uh, Native Americans. Uh, uh, but what I'm waiting, uh, are, uh, I'm waiting for some other members to be here. Supervisor. We'll, we'll delay it. Go ahead. I, I would just go ahead and pull it if you, if you want to pull it and then they'll, they'll, uh, and they'll give it a new number and then you can, somewhere. you can, uh, stick it in where you'd like in the agenda. Okay. I'll, I'll pull item number 32, but we don't, uh, normally we would put it at the end of the regular agenda. Uh, when they're here, I might uh, insert them earlier. Okay, is that all right, Patrick? Okay. And so I don't hear any I'm other sorry. items pulled. Chair, excuse me, Chair. We need to assign it a number. Do you want to assign it as 10.1 now? And if they choose to come, we can then move it further uh, up ahead. Okay. Okay, we, but we do need to give it a number now. So I'll assign it item number 10.1. It'll be 10.1? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, do we have uh, now is the opportunity for members of the public to address the board regarding topics on today's agenda, consent items, closed session agenda, and on topics that are not on the agenda, but are within the jurisdiction of the board if you cannot stay later to speak on a regular agenda item, you may address those items at this time, but you may only speak once on a particular topic. Uh, we'll have, we don't have too many people. We'll let you go with three minutes and see how that goes. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Drew Lewis. Uh, I have some recent uh, relevations here for you, uh, just in case you didn't get the memo. Uh, the World Health Organization's special envoy on COVID-19 is urging world leaders not to use lockdowns as the chief weapon against the virus. David Navarro, the special envoy named by the World Health Organization, told reporters, we, quote, we and the World Health Organization do not advocate lockdowns as the primary means to, of control this virus. By and large, we'd rather not do it. Navarro re specifically pointed to the devastation lockdowns have caused the ec economies of the world and to the severe social societal damage they caused to communities and those below the poverty line. Quote, this is a terrible, ghastly global catastrophe, actually, unquote, he said. Quote, and so we really do appeal to all world leaders, stop using lockdown as your primary control method, develop better systems for doing it, work together and learn from each other. But remember, lockdowns just have one consequence that you may, you must never ever belittle, and that is making poor people an awful lot poorer. Nabarro joins a growing community of medical and public health scientists and medical practitioners who are advocating for the abandonment of generalized lockdowns and mass quarantines. A significant group of dignitaries from the scientific and medical fields have signed a document titled the Great Barrington Declaration, which declares, quote, current lockdown policies are producing devastating effects on short and long-term public health, unquote. The leaders in the effort include professors, biostatisticians, epidemiologists, immunologists, health economists, public health policy experts, and other medical and scientific professionals from institutions such as Harvard University, Stanford University, and Oxford University, among others. And the CDC, uh, by the way, has uh, recently rescinded their uh, statement on masks saying that, they're, that the epidemiological studies basically uh, do not support their use for uh, stopping the virus. So by ignoring the guidelines by the WHO and the scientific community, you are continuing the disaster of job loss, closing businesses, homelessness explosion onto our streets and suicide increases in Santa Cruz County. These destructive policies you have chosen to impose on our communities will not be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi, good morning. Good morning. I am Veronica Velasquez, chapter president for SIU Local 521 Santa Cruz and also part of the board at SAIU. I'm also a senior social worker at Family and Children's Services. This summer, we expected to have regular negotiations like previous years. None of us expected that 2020 would bring a pandemic and fires to our community. However, I am proud of our membership. In March of 2020, we stepped up and have worked diligently to keep our community safe. In my department alone, over 60 social workers have continued to see children in their homes or in foster homes to ensure their safety, even at the risk of many of us catching COVID-19. In June of 2020, our members agreed to take a 7.5 furlough to help balance the county's budget. This was done so with no hesitation as we truly believe that we're in this together. In August, we received news that 30 of our members would be laid off. Needless to say, this brought the morale down among members. And now in September, the county is asking our members to pay for the health insurance increases. The county asked SCIU to continue the status quo, which means the county should use the 95, 90, 90 percentages using the 2021 rates and not the 2020 rate sheet. I have a petition signed by over 750 members who agree with us. With this petition, our members are asking the Board of Supervisors to provide them with dignity and respect and support us by having the county agree with SEIU's proposal. This pandemic highlighted for the world who the true essential workers are. And let's be clear, it is not mid and upper management. It is those who are on the front lines working directly with the community social workers like myself and my colleagues. Therefore, we ask that you stand with us and ensure that members have access to quality and affordable health care in Santa Cruz County. Thank you. I have the petition signed. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Great to see you all again. So I'm here today to ask each and every one of you to look inside of yourselves and ask yourselves, is this mic on? Yeah. Ask yourselves, why is it that you are not taking into consideration any of these points that are being brought up here at this podium as far as this COVID virus thing? We're talking about points that are not being brought up by a few loose screws of Santa Cruz. We're talking about points that are being brought up worldwide by doctors by people who have far more official education than I or many of the other people in this room, including those at these in your council. So ask each, each and every one of yourselves, I ask you, all of you, why are you not even looking at this information? Why is it not even being debated, discussed, considered? Why, why are the people coming up here talking about these things who are putting their effort into sharing this information? You guys are the ones should be, who should be bringing this information to our community saying, hey, other leaders around the world are bringing up these topics. Let's, let's have a community forum and talk about should we be considering some of these things that other leaders in other countries are also doing or even other parts of this country. So I, I would like each and every one of you to look deep inside yourselves and really ask yourselves, why? Why on earth would I not even be considering some of these very valid topics that are being discussed all over the world? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jay Rosella Myers and I just want to have this opportunity to encourage everyone to consider how they're voting for everything. It's so important to actually participate in our system, to have a say and to carefully consider when we're voting, whether it's propositions, whether the Board of Supervisors are voting on issues and how it affects everyone as individuals and the whole, the health of the whole community. And there's, um, the Quakers actually have a core set of values and that they call spices. And um, 
first, the S stands for simplicity, that we're always trying to do better and that we are working for peace. The P stands for peace. And that you try to solve disagreements without violence because this only makes other people suffer. Um, so, and they also, integrity. Integrity means being truthful and trying always to do a good job, no matter what it is that you're working on. And to take that to heart and really put yourself out there in terms of um, doing the best you possibly can. The C stands for community. And Santa Cruz has such an amazing community. And I hope we all value that piece of this, this um, where we all live. And E stands for equality. And I am such a big believer, which is why I have always voted and taken it very seriously and participated in the community activities. Um, and everyone is created equal and we should have liberty and justice for us all. Stewardship means to live with simplicity and integrity. And again, do the best you possibly can and take in as much information that will contribute to the bigger picture solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Yay, thank you. MonicaMcGuire.com. We sang about the problems last time, recounting the heinous corporate crimes with all of our questioning that's of what's hurting all humankind. Real people seeking how all our hearts can realign with music, dance, and good rhymes. Of 3,100 counties U.S., the CDC shows three quarters have less than 0.01 percentage leading to death. Though shell games played on uh, us usurp some focus, much more awoke us to use our true powers now. We are the ones we've waited for, rejecting fomented civil war by media bot by corporations. Since independence are one third of this nation, we're choosing creation. Go online to globalresearch.ca to seek news beyond corporate skews and hate. The game to now play is solving all these mysteries. Thriveon.com has two great Thrive Movement movies. Humanity, chaos is our opportunity. And we are the ones we've waited for, rejected fomented civil war by media bought by corporations. And independents are one third of this nation. We are creation, creating our future right now. Globalresearch.ca has absolutely amazing information. Many more are listed on thriveon.com with the incredible movies called Thrive Movements 1 and 2. It explains how and why what people have called conspiracy since the early 1960s with RF, JFK's uh, killing, all of that was created by the CEA. The idea of a conspiracy theory is something to dismiss people. Now we can actually wrap our arms around it with the incredible global community saying, conspiracy theory is just a way to shut down conversations. Why don't we instead look at the facts and see this is the greatest mystery of all time. And we really are like in a movie needing to save humankind. And honestly, it has to be done from county to county and trickle out from there. As you know, 3,142 counties in this country listed by the CDC, three quarters of us have zero or less than 0.01% death rate. These are things that show us this has hurt far, far more people than it has potentially saved. Because when you shut down half of small and medium sized businesses, you're telling people they have to go homeless. Thank you for uh, uh, singing part of it. Uh, you have a wonderful voice. You're so welcome. <laughs> Thank you for being here.
human. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Monica. That was fantastic. We always have to ask the questions, why is something happening and who benefits? So I was thinking, who's benefiting from all that's going on now with the lockdowns? And I, here's just a list off the top of my head. Well, SpaceX, the 5G satellites are being launched as we're supposed to be sheltering in place, but they're making a lot of money and creating a lot of harm from this. Um, the chemical corporations, all the disinfectants that are made uh, that are quite toxic, actually. The plastic manufacturers, uh, the computer companies, the Wi-Fi uh, makers, uh, Verizon. Mm, let's see, we could go on and on. And there's uh, so much plastic now. Uh, anyway, uh, but it's not the average person who's benefiting. They're suffering tremendously. And I also heard that 83% of the COVID relief money has gone to corporations, the military, and the banks. So who's benefiting? And then I heard, I was listening to, and I'll give you some references here. This is Rocco Galati, constitutionalrightscenter.ca, that's Canada. And he said the University of Mainz in Germany study 14 countries with little or no COVID measures fared no worse and mostly better than the countries that impose the COVID measures. Now that's quite a figure. We are having our constitutional and what minimal democratic rights remain taken away and living like in a police state. It's quite terrifying and I'll end with this question. But also I wanna refer before that to um, cellular phone task force.org and the newsletters of Arthur Furstenberg title, the most recent one is called, um, what is it called? Emergency in the heavens about all the satellites and the dangers posed. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Marilyn. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Um, an error doesn't become a mistake unless you refuse to correct it. I'm not gonna read the rest of what I wrote because it would be kind of unsavory. It has to do with John F. Kennedy and how he was killed and conspiracy theories and such. I suppose I could comment on the resolution of uh, number 18 on the consent agenda about the unanticipated revenue from FEMA. Uh, you know, I'm pretty busy. I'm almost a professional procrastinator. I have a small lawsuit going on right now that I kind of joke to myself that, wow, I'm gonna end up making 5,000 bucks an hour for doing this work. But now since I only have 31 hours left, it's about $10,000 an hour. And I really wish I wasn't having to do what I was doing because I have forgiven a lot of people in my life. So, you know, I stood for the pro pledge, of, pro pledge of Allegiance and I've been watching my son say the Pledge of Allegiance for a long time, and I said it as a child. I think this is quite interesting. They made us Pledge Allegiance with liberty and justice for all every morning from ages five to 18, and then get mad when we demand liberty and justice for all. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's unfortunate. So I found something yesterday, because I'm just constantly studying. I thought it was really beautiful, and it, it's said to be a Lakota prayer. Teach me how to trust my heart, my mind, 
my intuition, my inner knowing, the senses of my body, the blessings of my spirit, teach me to trust these things so that I may enter sacred spaces and love beyond fear and thus walk in balance with the passing of each glorious sun. I really thought that was quite beautiful. <laughs> um, Maybe I'm going to talk about some things that aren't quite beautiful. There's a great deal going on in our society that's just being hidden, and it's really unfortunate. Um, there's a lot of censorship going on in the media, and I can't believe how much of the stuff that I have attempted to save that has just been erased. I mean, my record. I mean, I was looking at, was engaging with a young man of 11, and I was, we got into a conversation. He, he was, he was asking me if I knew what adrenochrome was and I led him in a path that maybe he wasn't aware of that most of the meat that we're, we eat is killed in such a way that it produ produces those enzymes. It's really quite terrible, but you know, who knows what's gonna happen? We're gonna have a national election and you know, we have some weapons that don't create radiation, but they're the equivalent of 144 tons of TNT. So any one of those weapons could flood the entire California, could flood New York, or could flood Florida. So anyway, thank you. I'm glad to still be able to stand and be here. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, uh, do we have any uh, comments uh, from the uh, board members? Anything on the consent you'd like to uh, uh, comment on? Chair, I'd be happy to go first. Sure. Um, uh, just a couple items that I wanna uh, comment on, on item number 20, which is the quarterly report from our cannabis licensing office. I just wanna uh, acknowledge that it looks like the changes we made in our uh, ordinance to allow, um, to make it easier for people to uh, cultivate on commercial ag zone parcels is working. Uh, there's new, uh, lots of new permits there and also lots of new tax revenue. And it also looks like it's providing a place for people who may have been operating illegally to, to now um, uh, work uh, at a new space uh, in the commercially ag zoned uh, areas. So I appreciate the work of that office and I'm glad we kept that office together uh, during this recent uh, budget cuts. Um, on item number, uh, 37, uh, I just wanna point out that the State Department of Health is helping out Santa Cruz in a big way, uh, nearly $3 million uh, to help us with 12 full-time equivalent um, positions uh, to help with an enhanced detection of the COVID-19 virus. Uh, appreciate the work that all of our health staff was, is doing, but as we know, this is gonna be going on for a while and having additional staff will uh, make it easier for us to make sure that we can contain this virus here in Santa Cruz. And I think that's all I had. Okay. And uh, Supervisor uh, Friend. Thank you, Chair. The only item I have a brief comment on is on item 27. I just wanted to thank Supervisor Leopold for uh, taking the lead on this item in support of both legislation from uh, Senator Feinstein as well as Congressman Jimmy Panetta that would help communities with resiliency planning, as well as uh, remove some of the regulatory burdens for fire prevention and uh, mitigation. So I appreciate Supervisor Leopold working with our office on that. And uh, that's the only item I would like to comment on. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Supervisor Coonerty. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple items to comment on. Um, First on item number 20, I want to um, also thank uh, Sam Laforte and the Cannabis Licensing Office for their work in uh, speeding up the permitting process. Uh, I appreciate their responsiveness and look forward to um, getting these local businesses up and going and uh, generating tax revenue. On um, item number 27, I want to thank my colleagues uh, for their support of federal bills that will uh, support um, while reducing the threat of wildfire and assisting in resilience. Um, I think it's important that we, um, that we start increasing uh, support for this. Similarly, on item number 28, I wanna thank my uh, colleague, Supervisor Leopold, uh, for bringing this item forward with me that allows homeowners 
uh, who didn't sustain damage, but now um, are uh, around the county now want to make sure that their home is more resilient um, and make it easy for people while there's a, this awareness to bring their projects forward uh, and get them done uh, and reduce the threat to both their homes and also uh, nearby homes. Item number 44, which is the expansion of the downtown streets team. Um, I want to thank uh, the Department of Public Works for working with my office uh, to expand the streets team to the North Coast. It makes a big difference uh, because uh, as with the pandemic, we've had an increase in visitors uh, that increases the amount of trash on the North Coast. And we want to make sure we keep that area pristine um, and have it not go into the ocean or waterways, uh, trash going to the ocean or waterways. Um, and uh, I want to also appreciate the efforts uh, to expand the downtown streets team in the Depot Park area. Um, and uh, I, I note that it's uh, in part to reduce needle litter, which is continues to be a major issue in our community. Um, and while uh, I appreciate this expansion, I do look forward to a more comprehensive plan um, that can reduce syringe litter in the other parts of our community. But this is an important first step um, in that in that effort. And finally, on item number 48, I want to um, thank Jeff Gaffney and uh, Randy Morris, uh, Jeff Gaffney from Parks and Randy Morris from Human Services Department uh, to create these uh, learning pods for CalWORKs families. As we know, all families are struggling right now um, to maintain online schooling while also uh, and, and social distancing uh, while also supporting their kids uh, to develop and and learn and uh, it's incredibly important that we support these families and uh, I know I added um, significant burden to uh, to both HSD and park staff who were already uh, had a lot on their plates but I appreciate them working together to uh, expand this program in our community. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor McPherson, how are you? Very good. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, as good as can be under the circumstances. But on uh, item number 18, I want to thank the uh, multiple departments that have tracked uh, our expenses related to the CZU fire, uh, lightning fire response and recovery. It's been a huge undertaking, and unfortunately, it's far from over. Um, I also want to thank our state and federal partners for their huge role in covering the costs that we've, we've experienced in addition to all the support they are providing our residents whose homes were destroyed or uh, damaged. And I think it's worth pointing out that the county's piece of this uh, activity to date is $1.2 million that we're using our general fund contingency reserve to cover. Uh, it can't be overstated how important it is to have uh, this funding set aside, especially as we anticipate additional potential emergencies, such as de uh, a debris flow event. Um, and I, I thank the board for continuing to exercise caution when it comes to minimizing the use of our reserves, despite the ongoing COVID related hits to our revenues. Um, I think uh, the value of our reserve can't be overstated in these kinds of situations. I would uh, also like to, um, Note on item number 20, uh, the additional um, uh, additional uh, applications and interest in the cannabis uh, quarterly update that has been provided by Mr. Laforte and his staff. And I'm glad to see our cannabis business tax uh, receipts going up due to the increased licensing. Um, on item number 21, uh, thank the, uh, the CAO for this report. I'm glad that we were able to comply with the state's revised spending deadline so that we don't potentially lose any of these funds, uh, very valuable to our community, of course. Uh, the report says that we still have about $10 million left to spend, the more majority of which is to be uh, spent by the end of uh, this month. But the board has yet to see much of the details of these categories, such as nonprofit housing and small business areas. Um, I think there are some good stories to tell there about how we are supporting our community I would like to add some additional direction if I could uh, to this item. So I'd like to schedule a regular agenda item on this topic for November 17th meeting. So the public can benefit from knowing that detail uh, of where we've spent the money, which is really important as we near the December 31st deadline for 
spending all of the money. Um, I also would like to uh, repeat the uh, the thanks uh, item number 27 on the wildlife safety bill uh, to better manage our forests and energy systems will um, greatly reduce the fire risk over time. Um, and as uh, Mr. Leopold said about uh, number item number 37, uh, the COVID funds, um, I want to thank the Health Services Administration. Uh, we, they, we're lucky to have a great staff who continue to do a great job in managing our response, which will be all the more important as we see a spikes in cases this winter, which we're it's being done, which is happening throughout the nation. Um, the, the item number 44, the downtown street team is just a really great success story and the human services and public works departments uh, should be uh, congratulated for working closely with the downtown streets team to leverage these funds to support job training and community cleanups. Um, I'm also pleased to have the downtown streets uh, team working in our various districts and I look forward to an expansion now in the future. Uh, you, the downtown streets team has really answered the call to cover numerous gaps in our community and there should be commended for their efforts. It's been very much appreciated. And I might say that uh, my, one of my staff members, one of my analysts, J.M. Brown, did a lot to uh, have that created. And uh, it's just been a really great success story. Um, and items number 49 through 53, the permanent room housing hearings. Um, I look forward to these hearings. And I'm glad that property owners are taking advantage of these uh, districts that we work so hard to establish. And I look forward to uh, discussing them in uh, upcoming meetings that we have on the Board of Supervisors. And that's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll just mention something on item number 18, <clears throat> adopt a resolution and it says in unanticipated revenue, we're talking about uh, $10 million. I, I've never seen numbers like this on unanticipated uh, uh, revenue, federal uh, emergency money, state emergency money, uh, contingencies. Uh, these are an incredible amount of money. And uh, uh, I think we know who pays for all of it. All of you, the yeah. taxpayers, uh, we appreciate everything you do. And uh, everything that we uh, try to do and are doing is because of your uh, generosity and uh, your uh, commitment to uh, keeping everything going. And that's about it. <clears throat> if uh, we have a motion for the consent agenda uh, in a second. I would move the consent that's agenda moved. as amended. Okay, and the clerk will conduct the roll call. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Chair Caput? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, we'll now move to the uh, regular agenda, starting with item number seven. presentation on the Santa Cruz County blueprint blueprint for shared safety survivors at the center as outlined in the memorandum of the chief probation officer. And we'll wait for him to come up. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Hi. Are you coming up? Any way you'd like to do it, it's fine. Good morning, Chair Caput. And board members, Fernando Geraldo, Chief Probation Officer. I'm here today to briefly introduce two individuals and the important work they've done 
to increase support for survivors of crime. In a moment, you'll hear from Sarah Emmert, Director of Community Organizing at the United Way, and also Celia Nieto, Victim Witness from the District Attorney's Office. They're about to share their role along with the support of the Community Corrections Partnership, Community Engagement and Education Work Groups, and many others to implement the Blueprint for Shared Safety Framework, first introduced to our county in 2017. The presentation will highlight a report that is a culmination of nearly two years of committed work by the community education and engagement work groups and many others who have volunteered to help push forward an agreed upon framework for addressing the unique needs of crime survivors in a manner which is trauma informed, healing and inclusive. The shared safety framework has helped our criminal justice system stakeholders and local service providers and community members design a response to advance how we serve, serve survivors of crime. The work is also aligned and supported by the 2018 to 2024 County Strategic Plan Comprehend, Comprehensive Health and Safety Focus Area. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Um, Thank you, County Supervisors, for having us. Um, as Fernando said, my name is Sarah Emmert. I'm the Director of Community Impact with United Way of Santa Cruz County. I'm also the coordinator for the Community Corrections Partnership Community Education and Engagement Work Group. Sylvia? And I'm Sylvia Nieto. I'm a former director of the Victim Witness Assistance Program in the District Attorney's Office. We very much look forward to briefly sharing with you the recent work of the Community Corrections Partnership, Community Education and Engagement Workgroup and its work around shared safety and crime survivors. Firstly, I wanna express my deepest appreciations for the Community Corrections Partnership, Community Education and Engagement Workgroup members for their countless in-kind contributions, for actively participating in our monthly meetings, for their thought leadership, for being real and vulnerable, for grappling with complex issues and topics. It's definitely a dynamic group with diverse perspectives, which is exactly what we needed to move this work forward. Sylvia? I think one of the most significant things that I personally experienced along with my cohort, Anna Rubalkova from the DA's office, was that within the group, um, we started out with polarized groups of people and we moved to a space where we were working together for a common goal. And that was a really wonderful thing to experience. Great, thanks Sylvia. Um, and, and really it was us coming together with, from a place of shared values and our commitment for equity and safety and compassion for our community. And additionally, I wanna recognize our funders, the Community Corrections Partnership, the Fund for Nonviolence and a generous anonymous donor. We wanna recognize the other community members who inform this process and importantly, survivors of crime. The Community Education and Engagement Work Group, known as the CEEW, is a longstanding group of the Community Corrections Partnership and has traditionally played a role in engaging the broader community on various criminal justice system reform related issues. So AB 109, Proposition 47, and others through workshops, focus groups, and various community forums. Then in 2017, through Chief Geraldo's connections to the Californians for Safety and Justice, he proposed that the Blueprint for Shared Safety be the new focus of the CEEW. The Blueprint Report, an 84-page document, which I promise you I'm not gonna go through today, <laughs> outlines, for example, why do we need to adopt safety as a public health issue? What does it take to implement? What are some outcome measures? What are some questions communities should ask about this? and importantly, examples from other communities. I believe you all received this matrix overview, but when you look at the various components of the blueprint matrix, we are already doing so many things that are aligned with it. And there is definitely a gap between where we are today and where we want to be as a community. Sylvia. To be better informed, the CEEW engaged in an asset gap analysis from 2018 through 2019. We engaged 175 individuals in this process. It was a very diverse group representing North and South County, diverse by age, Spanish monolingual speakers and English speakers and position in the community. Besides asking about gaps, we asked what shared safety means to you. 
we heard various things like healing, equity, resources. After analyzing, we asked survivors, is this what, this is what we heard, is there anything you want to add? After we collected the data to all five pillars of shared safety, we quickly realized the largest gap involved crime survivors at the center. We started a deep dive into that issue. The words victim and survivor are used interchangeably in the report. That means individuals impacted by crime. On May 28, 2020, the CCP Executive Committee adopted the blueprint for shared safety, crime survivors at the center phase one. Please note that the 47 page report is not an operational plan, but merely a guiding document, a starting point, phase one of this work. And we invite all of you to dive deeper into the report. Some of the gaps and needs we heard from the community were things such as mistrust of the system, meaningful accountability, awareness, and lack of information, need for trauma-informed systems, and lack of data. These findings are not unique. We use the workgroup reference significant victim reports published by the Office for Victims of Crime, Victim Compensation in the State of California, and Survivors for Safety and Justice. After working with crime survivors in our community for over 21 years, the things that I would like to share with you, among with, along with people in our group, were that victims want and need to be heard. Victims need resources to move forward in their healing. Those resources include trauma-informed systems such as courts, schools, churches, therapists, medical community, and each of us. Victims want to move forward from victim to survivor. They didn't ask for the crime to happen and they need our help for healing. The report includes 11 recommendations. They're listed in no particular order. They are based on research, data, and best practices. One way of looking at them is to include things that we can do now, such as improving data collection, increasing survivor engagement, and increasing our trauma-informed training. And we can also look at it in terms of things that require investment, such as crime survivor navigators, increased services for victims of crime, and trauma recovery centers. Thank you, Sylvia. So I do want to point out, and I really want to kind of bold underline this point, that in meeting the needs of crime survivors, we are increasing safety in our community. We know from research and data um, that trauma and unmet needs increases the likelihood of unhealthy behavior, substance use, committing crime and violence themselves, and it also negatively impacts physical and mental health. We want to point out that prior to the completion of the report, as a community, we already saw and have seen shifts due to the intentional collective shared safety work. In 2018, the CEW partnered with UC, UC Santa Cruz Probation and Smart on Crime to host a community forum on restorative justice, featuring Fania Davis, which actually led to the new Santa Cruz County neighborhood courts model. We've seen culture shifts, seen the shift in language from victim to survivor, Every CEW organization that works with survivors has indicated that they have increased the normalization of asking survivors what they need to heal. Organizations have also mentioned an increased overall mindfulness of client needs and sensitivity to crime survivors. New partnerships have stemmed out of the CEW, both in terms of partnering on collaborative grants as well as resource referrals, more and more, we are hearing about an increase in support for restorative justice practices from judges and district attorneys, service providers. And I do want to emphasize what Sylvia said about, you know, when we first came together due to the diverse representation of the CEW, came with very different points of view. But what shared safety has done is it creates a common language and a shared goal for all of us to work towards, regardless of the positions that we take on criminal justice. And just recently, the CEW partnered with the Office for Victims of Crime and hosted a September 25th trauma-informed leadership training. Over 65 system leaders attended, including the County Administrative Office, Health and Human Services, Law Enforcement Probation, the District Attorney's Office, and the courts. 
Additionally, it should be noted that the shared safety work has shaped the county's strategic plan. These are just a few of the objectives that are directly connected to this report and the project. So what's next? We are identifying which recommendations are short-term versus long-term and which recommendations can be implemented with limited funds by leveraging existing resources and simply doing things differently. Some of the recommendations that the CEEW prioritized include system trainings, like the trauma-informed leadership one we did, survivor engagement, data, a discussion to improve financial restoration, and criminal justice system survivor trust building. Additionally, we commit to engaging with other collaboratives and will enroll those who have a role to play in taking responsibility for specific recommendations. We will continue to explore survivor engagement models, both formal and informal, to provide space for survivor voices to be heard, to provide capacity building and leadership opportunities, with a vision of deeper engagement by survivors of crime leading some of this work in the future. This winter, we plan to organize a virtual shared safety community forum to engage the broader community on the shared safety work and building off of the Youth Violence Prevention Network's law enforcement community dialogues on race and policing. In the spring, we plan to partner with Watsonville Police Department to roll out shared safety dialogues that will involve youth and crime survivors, shifting the current polarizing conversations to focus on co-creating public safety solutions. In closing, we'd just like to share with you that the survivor engagement piece is so important. It's really um, a great opportunity for us as a community to hear survivors' voices. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, no one asks to be a victim of crime. People want to be survivors of a crime and they need our help and our attention to do that. And I think working together with the principles that are being activated through um, Communities for Shared Safety is really gonna help our community move closer to uh, a healed community where people are trauma informed and victims have hope because that's something a lot of people don't have when they go through the system. Um, and there was so many lessons learned from this process. You know, for example, the importance of multidisciplinary collaboration and diverse perspectives as we grapple with these complex issues. You know, crime survivors have diverse stories, experiences and needs. And we have to be very thoughtful and intentional about doing this work. Moving forward, we would love to be invited back next year to provide an update as to where we are with the shared safety work. And perhaps it can be tied in with, with an update from those that are responsible for moving the county's strategic plan objectives 157 and 162 forward. Also, one key recommendation that we can really use some thought leadership on is survivor engagement. There are communities across the state that are developing local survivor networks and chapters to elevate the voices of those that are most impacted by the issue. They help create solutions that promote shared safety in communities. And many of these evolve out of grassroots organizing. Originally, we were exploring the potential of shifting the Domestic Violence Commission into a broader Crime Victim Commission, but we know that transformed into the Justice and Gender Commission, which we totally support. Um, whether it's future financial investments or tangible ideas for getting something off the ground, any support would be appreciated. Again, thank you so much. And we look forward to our continued partnership for creating shared safety in Santa Cruz County. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Are there any board members uh, uh, that have questions? Uh, Supervisor Friend? Chair, I don't have any questions. I do appreciate this presentation and this shared, um, this collaboration. I think that one of the, the main points that was raised very early on was the breaking down of these silos, bringing together both the nonprofit organizations, the remarkable work of the DA's Office of the Victim Services and Probation and others to really look at things in a new way. It harmonizes so well with everything else that the county and the board has been trying to do uh, in regards to not just criminal justice reform, but greater participation from the most disenfranchised and voices that aren't normally at the table. And so 
I just appreciate the work that, that was presented here and all those that um, are willing to present. I know that this has been worked on for a long time and I appreciate that you've been given the opportunity uh, to, to daylight that today. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. I wanna thank uh, everybody for their work on this. I really appreciate the way it's a ground up um, approach where you're really bringing voices from all parts of our community to have these conversations. Um, I appreciated the suggestion that uh, perhaps you could come back um, and engage the board again on how this meets the strategic objectives that we've set. Um, and specifically, the piece that I'm really interested in is uh, recommendation A, which is to help victims better navigate the system, and recommendation E, which is to involve victims in policy discussions. Um, I, uh, I don't know whether a commission is right or the current structure is right, but I'd be interested in your feedback as to how we get um, good outcomes on this and how we can return to have uh, victim informed uh, discussions about uh, improving communications within the systems and then overall policies that the county can, can set so that hopefully we have fewer victims uh, of crime and that when we do, uh, they're better served by the system. So I, I look, I don't have the answers, but I look forward to uh, continuing this discussion and um, putting that charge with you all um, to bring back some sort of tangible steps we can take in order to improve the system. Thank you. Okay, uh, Supervisor uh, McPherson. Yeah, they, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is These are all great recommendations, and I, I really want to thank the probation department for all the great work that has gone into these recommendations. Uh, it's really important, comprehensive work, and I look forward to learning more about how we can achieve them. I hope we can find the funding to implement uh, these uh, various programs. Uh, congratulations to the concerted effort for meeting over, uh, what, two years, you said, uh, 100 75 community members were engaged. Uh, it really uh, is a great community effort. You should be applauded for that. Um, my question is, uh, I think you said you were going to be coming back with a report in, year, uh, in one year. Uh, my questions are about funding and tracking uh, and how do we anticipate we might fund and, and centrally track progress on these goals over time, uh, given the multiple agencies that have a role. Um, you've done a great job in getting multiple agencies putting together, but I just want to make sure that we, uh, I just want to understand more about how you're going to get all this together and making a report, say, in a year. Well, I could uh, start, you know, I just wanted the contribution. Most of it has been really volunteer time. Every, in addition to everyone's work, uh, their day-to-day -day work, they've, They've uh, served this purpose. Um, however, you're right, there would be additional funding necessary. And, you know, we hope, for instance, I'll give you an example, Prop 47, which we applied for intentionally, and we received that grant award, and that was able to really start the neighborhood courts. So that's one way, right, uh, applying that's a competitive grant, but look for revenue sources such as that that exist. And so, and maybe there's, uh, we've, We've had uh, local funders, uh, even uh, private donations. So seek those opportunities. And uh, hopefully when we pull out of our, um, you know, situation that we're all in right now and the economy improves, perhaps, you know, we could find lo more local resources. Very good. I'll, I'll tell you, if any, any department can be successful in getting grants, uh, look no further than the probation department. They have been phenomenal over the years in getting uh, well-deserved grants from state and federal agencies. So congratulations in the past and good good uh, luck in the future. This is gonna be a, a great asset for our Santa Cruz County community. Uh, thanks, Bruce. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I just wanna acknowledge the uh, speakers. Uh, Ms. Nieto has uh, uh, introduced herself as formally with the uh, DA's office and uh, uh, supporting uh, survivors of crime and I just want to acknowledge your years of service your commitment Thank to the you. community and your involvement in this process uh, I think it's it's critically important and the role that you uh, you played here at the county helped many many people so I just want to acknowledge that here at the board and thank you for coming back thank you. Uh, for this presentation 
Uh, also the United Way, uh, you know, the United Way 10 years ago decided to get involved in the area of criminal justice uh, issues here in Santa Cruz County. I think that, that, that the agency has played an incredibly important role in broadening that discussion and, and helping break down sort of the silos and just um, creating a safer space for people to come and have these difficult discussions. And so as you describe it uh, uh, in your presentation, uh, I know I've been in some of those meetings and um, it's, it's a good challenge to be in. And I just appreciate the leadership that United Way has shown and the long-term commitment is made uh, to making our criminal justice system work better here in Santa Cruz County and supporting the survivors of, uh, of crime. Uh, lastly, the probation department, uh, which has been a long time leader, not just here in Santa Cruz County, but in the nation uh, about uh, thinking creatively about how we address issues of criminal justice, whether it be at the juvenile level or the adult level, um, has uh, created uh, models that, uh, that others seek to replicate. And that uh, your interest in wanting to bring this uh, blueprint for uh, share, uh, shared safety here um, is another example of a great leadership. And I appreciate the, the place that you've created and the time that you and your staff have committed uh, to these kind of activities. You know, uh, when we, uh, I was part of the Justice and Gender Task Force and one of, the, one of the regular sayings that we repeated there is nothing about us with, without us. And the idea that, that you have incorporated the voices of survivors of crime as part of this report makes this report stronger. And uh, we need to look broadly at the issue of survivors of crime. And I'm, I know that, uh, that the idea that we're working to fill the gaps in our trauma-informed services for survivors of crime is critically important. And especially if we wanna just break the cycle for the individual and for the family, um, th that, uh, that trauma-informed care could re really help um, the, the individual, but it also helps just general public safety. And I, I appreciate the, the lens that you've put on this to, to, and the language that you've put on this uh, so we could have that critical discussions and we can actually work to create programs that, uh, that make sense. You know, um, the, one of the recommendations uh, that came out of this is to look at uh, restorative justice practices. Just last night, a supervisor friend and I, along with Sheriff Hart, uh, Capitol Police Chief, um, and our DA and Elaine Johnson were on a community meeting to talk about the neighborhood court system, which I think provides one way in which we can look at restorative justice in which uh, victim and offenders could, could potentially be together, uh, that they can address the harm that uh, has been caused and work towards um, uh, uh, remediating um, that harm in some way. It's one small step. This is a, just a portion of, uh, of the crimes that are committed here in Santa Cruz, but I think it's an important step and I just uh, appreciate the work that everybody involved in the DA's office, the probation, um, and the work that you all did together to get the grant to help to be able to fund this. Uh, it really becomes an important part of the toolkit of how we address public safety here um, in Santa Cruz County. And the idea of creating some kind of res uh, resource center for crime survivors um, that I think that, the pub uh, that probation is gonna be engaged in, I think is, is really critically important uh, to have those resources for survivors. And I appreciate the leadership that you're showing and, and working to create a, a, that asset here in Santa Cruz County. This is a really good report. I would look forward to uh, you coming back because the report like this can't sit on the shelf. It, it's gonna, it, it, it took a lot of conversations to have it, but in order to, to make it happen, we have to continue on and push. And we as a board may be challenged to, to, to say, we need to provide resources to, in order to, uh, to, to make the reality of this report um, positive for the community, for survivors of crime, uh, and for public safety in general. So thank you for your work. Thank you. I want to thank you also for your uh, work. And, uh, and I noticed on the group of uh, different uh, organizations that you work with, collaborate with, uh, part of your blueprint, uh, Community Action Board, CAB, mm -hmm. uh, they're real important in South County for the Santa Cruz County uh, Immigration Project. 
uh, working with them. They help people in South County get paperwork done and uh, some of the, you know, the undocumented. So they have a temporary resident card, permanent resident card, or also a path to uh, citizenship. And uh, I noticed the public defender's office, uh, you mentioned them on there and uh, their partnership and part of this. How, how does that work out? Uh, if uh, any of you want to just, you know, comment on the public defender's part. Yeah, so as I said earlier, you know, because of the complexities of some of the conversations that we were grappling with, we knew that we needed those that represented different kind of points of view from public safety and criminal justice. So including the district attorney's office, including the public defender's office, including community action board who had, you know, played a major role in engaging, you know, especially the South County residents, monolingual, undocumented um, survivors of crime. And, you know, we had to do a lot of intentional work, I think in the very beginning of these conversations to create as, as uh, uh, Supervisor Leopold said, a safe space to disagree on things and to say, actually, this is our experience, or this is what the uh, victims of crime that we work with have said. Um, and so, you know, for a long standing for the past two years, you know, these groups have been committed to coming together to continue, not only with the report, but strategically, how do we move some of these recommendations forward? Great, and uh, as far as the help that they do give the, uh public defender's office, uh, you'd say they help a lot. Uh, they do a very good job or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, Cassie Gasapura was the original public um, defender uh, representative that attended the meetings for the several years. And then when she transitioned to Monarch Services, Larry Bigham himself actually started attending the meetings, um, especially as we were grappling with like, um, solidifying the recommendations and identifying which ones the community education and engagement work group could help move forward. Okay, thank you. And uh, we'll open up to public comment. Uh, hi, Marilyn, you're on. Hi, Greg. Um, I took notes on what you said, some of the phrases where you're talking about victims of crime, that we want equity, safety, and compassion for members of our community. You stop, spoke about violence prevention networks and recommendations and uh, supervisor friends said we want to represent the most disenfranchised. And Ryan Coonerty talked about imposing uh, uh, changes in county policies. Now, I'm thinking in the context, a couple of areas here. One is what is going on right now with the lockdown, the emergency orders, the mass unemployment, we have consequential increases in suicide, domestic violence, desperation, poverty, hunger. So if the county is serious about changing policies that cause these crimes, we need to get back to normal and not have this emergency, so-called emergency. I'm also thinking of a friend of mine who suffered criminal assault, I call it, but it was under the category of a wellness check. Jeez, and I called you about this the night it happened, Supervisor Caput, because I was so shaken by it. She's 67 years old. Four sheriff deputies came to her house and handcuffed her, took her in the car roughly, and she has injuries to this day. Take it, and it was like about seven in the morning. She was in her night clothes. She couldn't even grab her purse, a so-called wellness check. They take her over to behind Dominican, called Telecare, 
taken in an ambulance to the San Jose Behavior Health and couldn't get out for, it's more than the 72 hours hold. She was there, I think 14 days altogether. And she still suffers from injuries from being injected against her will got a huge bill of thousands of dollars that Medicare paid part of it. This is a crime. You want recommendations? A wellness check should involve only people who are social workers or helping, not sheriff deputies brutalizing people. This is a crime. Thank you. Thank you. So true. Hi. Again, I'm Monica McGuire. I am a health coach and I have helped countless families through the child and family rights advocacy work that is alive and strong in this county because there are thousands of, county, of families here with children being harmed by our systems that are not being performed correctly. The mere fact that we have a victim's assistance center shows that all this work has been done before and why it hasn't been enacted correctly, why there are still so many people being harmed and not helped by the DA's office, why there are so many ways that you haven't followed what Placer County Board of Supervisors has done so well. They actually let people call in to make their statements. We had another letter today that didn't get read that hopefully is going to get read after me now at the public comment period by Satya Orion. We had the beautiful experience, I and others who went to visit Placer County to see what it was like where they do listen, know their constituents by name, call town hall meetings all the time, ask us their primary job duty of what it is that we need and want in order to make sure that the existing laws get applied correctly to help the largest number of the people in this county all the time. You all voted five to nothing again on the consent agenda item, again, including way more than you thought. Mr. Caput, it's actually closer to $12 million that you've received on, be, on behalf of this county, supposedly because of emergency measures for uh, COVID. But of course, we know we don't have any emergency measures because our numbers are too small and so you have sacrificed small businesses and families like the ones being supposedly helped turned them into victims by making all these small businesses go out of business all their employees now have to face homelessness and the numbers that you have harmed here are so much greater it's insane but there's another beautiful aspect of going to see Placer County and Davis and all the places where the bike lanes have been implemented that we need and want that all the health measures that we need all the things that help people to live better that this county has wholly ignored for at least 10 years and why a subject like this has to be brought up again because our victims are not being served. I spoke with hundreds of people directly who were not only not served by the victim services when it came down to what do you really need to see change? We all said what we need is to make sure that these things stop happening. And you're talking about restorative justice 10 years on without actually doing enough to create restorative justices for those families that are hurt is abysmal. And the fact that we need restorative justice now from the five of you and everybody in other high paying jobs in this county to find out what it is that you have neglected to do that Placer County and other similar counties have not neglected. They have done everything since March the way they needed to, to listen to the people and do what the people were asking to to find out what the needs and wants were of the greatest number and make sure that that got addressed. Uh, any web comments? There are no web comments on this item, thanks. But what about the public comment from Satya Orion? Why was that not read? I know she sent it in time. Uh, we, and we have to... Okay. We have to so we times. we have to have some order here. You can't, it is, you, it is you got order. your time. There was no re
time to speak. Chair Caput. We should shut the meeting Chair down Caput, and take a break. Your uh, own policy. Yeah. Yeah. Chair Caput, Chair, we should take a break and clear the room. Pull a recess if, uh, if we can't get order here. This is a t public I'm comment time. Uh, Chair, why don't we have to take a five minute break? I think, let me. You are harming everyone in this county with your negligence. All right. Uh, we'll bring it back to the board then, right? Or no? Um, there actually is no action taken on this. It was simply a presentation. So there's no vote that is needed. Okay. I want to thank you for your, your work and, okay. and ongoing Thanks. work. And congratulations on your retirement. You. And I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you. We'll bring it back. To, is there a motion uh, by the board? There, the no second? motion is needed because it's it's only an informational item. Correct. Yeah. We can move on to item eight. Okay. So that. Chair, we yeah. chair over here. We can move to item number eight if you would like, or if you wanted to hear your ten point one now, so you could do uh, that too. You it's mean up to 10 .1? you. Ten point one. Ten point one is the one that you. Take took off the consent item and made a regular agenda item. Well, we could uh, we could take a. Uh, how about you, Patrick? Are you ready? Anybody else coming? Okay. All right. Uh, we'll 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 do uh, uh, ten point one, and then right after that, we'll have a ten minute break. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, come on up, uh, both of you. Uh, these are. Uh, Members of the Pajaro Valley, uh, Ohlone, Custanoan, Mutsen tribe. And uh, hey, uh, come on up and sit up here. Sure. And chair, don't forget you'll have to read number, th you'll have to read it into the name? The, the action. Uh, is, I'd like to uh, greet you uh, in the language of uh, Hania Itiama. Good morning, people. Yeah, do you, uh, the one that's with you, uh, do you want to come up here, please? can sit up over here. Uh, brief, but yeah. uh, uh, please state your names. And, Chair, uh, I think you want to uh, read the item into the, uh, the read the item into the, the record. Yeah. Well, my name is uh, Patrick Orozco. I'm the tribal chairman of the Pajaro Valley Alone Indian Council, uh, or a nonprofit organization I formed in 1985. Also, chairman of a petition that, that I submitted to uh, in Washington to the BIA Bureau of Indian Affairs. In 1995, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how I got started. Uh, it was mostly to my grandmother who taught me all that she, uh, that she had taught me, that she had learned in her prior years. Uh, I'm 81 years old, and I was born here in Watson, Santa Cruz County. My grandmother was born here in Santa Cruz County. My great-grandmother was born here in Santa Cruz County, and our ancestors go back something like 12,000 or more years. Uh, my grandmother taught me just about everything I know, you know, and uh, one of her uh, directions to me was to uh, go out and teach the young ones, our families, our tribe. Uh, she said these words, you have, I have taught you all that I have learned. Now you must go out and learn from others that know more than what I have taught you. And when you have learned these things, you must teach our tribe, our people. And when they have learned these things, you must go out and share it with the public. In this way, they will know that we are still here. 
So that's what I've been doing for the past 45 years, you know? And uh, I can go on and on. I've been going to schools all, uh, for 45 years, teaching the young ones of the, 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 the culture of our ancestors that walked these lands for all yeah. those years. Uh, uh, I've, I've seen you go into the nursing homes and the nursing past homes, and, yes, uh, uh, different places. I, I was really surprised because uh, these the nursing homes, the people were real quiet. They, they looked like they had nothing to do. But when I started singing songs from them, they all got up and started dancing with me. That surprised me. They needed more entertainment, you know, to keep them keep them uh, active, you know. But anyway, I'm here. I'm here before this uh, uh, commission to ask for uh, an approval of a resolution for federal recognition. Uh, and uh, I would really appreciate, you know, uh, you approve this resolution to our tribe. And I'll turn over to my sure. vice chairman. Introduce yourself. My name is Teresa Alderetti. I am Patrick's niece. I'm also <clears throat> the vice chair of Pearl Valley Ohlone Indian Council. And like Pat said, uh, he's been working for a lot of years, changing people's lives. And my life was one of them. I was a... Um, I was involved in drugs and alcohol my entire, up until I turned 36. And Patrick always encouraged me, encouraged me to change my life, get better, come, come and learn our culture, our traditions. And, and so in 1998, I, I, I had enough of that lifestyle that I was living, unhealthy, unhealthy lifestyle. And so I, I went to uh, program and um, with Pat's help, I I've been clean and sober 24 years already, and I've made it my life's work to give back and to help to break the cycle of the, the young children that are don't have I, I don't want to see these young children our family members not even just our family members but all the young children um, I don't want to see them waste half of their life like I did, so we we reach out to them when they're young and try to um, encourage them to walk a different path. Um, that's what we do, and I made that my life's work. And, and I also, um, I do the tribal research, the genealogy. We've recently gotten into the DNA um, part of it. And I do that because Patrick has spent like 40 years maybe, and my cousin another 30 years, and a lot of our family members have spent years and years trying to research who we are, where we came from, so that these children have a, an identity, they, they know who they are. And so now that we've done that, um, they don't have to do that anymore. It's all written out for them. They know who they are, where they come from. And, um, and that helps them to, have, to know who they are. They're not just somebody lost in the world. Like this, the uh, previous speaker was talking about generational trauma and that's what we suffer from. But with the work that Pat does, that we do together with the children, um, it helps them a lot. It helps them get on the good foot. My son here um, was three years old when my life changed and my son has never had to go, go through any of the things that I went through during my lifetime. And I'm very proud of him. He's now a veteran, he's in the, in the reserves. And so that's, that's what we do. We, we just try to help everyone, try to encourage them. We do good work everywhere we go. We, we're, we work on different projects with the community and so that's, uh, I, I would like to see the resolution. My uncle Pat has put in a lot of hard work, a lot of hard work, and he loves doing it and he continues to do that. Thank you. Hi, Hi I'm uh, Lois Robin and I'm a writer and a photographer and I've been interested in working uh, with the uh, Indian folks of this area for a, a long time, 20, 30 years. And I have uh, observed that uh, Patrick Orozco has given a great deal to this community in many, many ways. He's right there with his people. He supports them. He helps them. He works with them. And uh, there's no doubt that he is a, a genuine tribal leader in this area. Um, <clears throat> the problem has come up with federal recognition at the federal level. Uh, the federal government has, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, they've recognized some of the tribes in California, the very large ones, but the ones that have been spread out and are small, they, they don't understand that because the people at the Department of Interior, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, 
they're more used to the Eastern tribes that are very large and politically well organized. Whereas the tr tribal people here have been uh, in small communities for the most part. They're just as much Indian as anyone else, but they haven't been recognized as such. And it helps if there's local recognition of an Indian tribe and I think this is a very good move to recognize uh, Patrick's tribe. It's very important and will lead eventually to the federal recognition, which is really important. It has benefits that are very valuable for the Indian people and they're entitled to it. They are Native American people. And there's, there's, a, uh, there's a problem with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which I hope that will change too. Some of us are working on that at that level because of this great unfairness that's happening. So by supporting him locally, it's one step closer to eventual that, eventually getting that federal recognition that they all need. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, sir, I, I notice your, it says Army veteran. Were you in the Army? Yes, uh, my uh, name is uh, Marcus Rodriguez, and um, I'm a tribal member of the Power Valley Lone Indian Council. For over 20 years, um, I've been dancing with, the, with this organization for 23 years to be exact, since I was four years old. I haven't missed a year of dancing, of doing ceremonies without this organization that my uncle has started and my family has been a part of. I probably wouldn't be here today. I probably would be incarcerated. I probably would be on the streets. Like my mom was saying that the generational trauma has ended with me. And without this organization, our family wouldn't be here. Um, I've gone with my uncle Patrick to several schools throughout, throughout um, my time with the organization to go do presentations throughout Santa Cruz County, Monterey County, San Francisco, Santa Clara County. And it's all, we're all here for a good cause. We're all here to show everyone that we are still here. And I've been able to take our teachings and our, our songs and been able to become a head dancer in our group. In my time in the, in the service, I was uh, deployed back in 2013, 2014, 2015, and I took our songs and practiced our songs while I was overseas in Kuwait to continue our uh, teachings and be able to come back and to continue the teachings to our uh, next generation. Our next generation is here now. Yeah. <clears throat> well, yeah, you'll be uh, very important uh, to the future of the whole organization because as people are getting older uh you know people like yourself are younger and you you know take over and carry on the tradition i know it's uh, difficult to do uh one question i have i i just remember uh when my son was uh 40 four years old he's 15 now so that would be about 11 years ago uh, this year, I guess you're not going to have the night of the uh, the bear up at Mount Madonna. I can't remember. I just remember my son remembers that it was very cold and it was midnight uh, up in Mount Madonna. Uh, when do you normally do that? We usually do that in, uh, in the month of June, you know, but uh, this uh, this year we couldn't do it because of the virus, you know. Uh, I, uh, I uh, got that together in 1989. And it was, uh, it was to put together to bring all people all, from all walks of life, from all walks of life, you know, as one people, you know, to share their songs, their stories, you know. Yeah. And uh, it's a three-day event, you know. It's been going since 1989. Uh, I was also chairman of the Tana Council at the time that we put that together. I was running two organizations, which is a, a lot of work, you know. I did my four years, and before I, before I stepped out from the chairmanship, I got Mount Madonna. Yeah. For, for the for tenor console, but we still participate yeah. as dancers. A, a beautiful ceremony, and my, like I said, my son still remembers that uh, uh, the bear coming out uh, <laughs> at uh, midnight and yeah. uh, the fire and uh, uh, the whole. Uh, the Hopefully, whole. we'll have it next year. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you for carrying on all those traditions and uh, sharing those with uh, everybody. 
But uh, if you have any other questions uh, for us, uh, want to we're very happy to give you the resolution we'll we'll have a, a printed copy of the resolution later i guess huh correct once it's uh, been approved by signed by the chair and adopt fully adopted um, we can circulate the resolution yeah that'll be fine and our we'll fact our petition that. is 147 our petition with uh, uh washington dc uh bia is 147. Thank you very much. Uh, take care and God bless you. Thank you. Chair, we, uh, <coughs> we have to take public comment. We have to take public comment. We have to vote on it. No, no, we, <coughs> we have to take public comment now on this item. Oh, that's right. And then we also have to vote yeah, on it. Yeah, you're right, you're yeah. right. Yeah, we have a public comment. Uh, please, uh, <laughs> So long as you listen to people, and it's just such a bummer that you didn't read Satya Ryan's letter still, but uh, this is wonderful to see. Thank you all so much for coming and helping us all understand what hasn't been done all this time. It's pretty shocking. I know you know that we've been here before, a number of us saying Indians are so disrespected that the Aptos Village project simply bulldozed through the 35, the parts of the 35 acre original historic village, all the parts of the Chinese dwellings that were there before as well, and all of the history was simply bulldozed. Uh, just like most of their rights have been bulldozed until now, really great to go ahead and do some resolution now. I doubt it's the first time it's been requested, but if you're going for it, yay. That's one good thing today again, but really, really late. Too bad it's so late because they've been harmed so drastically for so long. And that's not really news, is it? We know that. And that we know that in this county, people of color have had trouble compared to everyone else in too large numbers. So thank you for doing something today to undo some of it. I, I can't see all the details and hope that it'll have more teeth than the victim's assistance that I spoke to with the last item. Um, but it is important to just keep pointing out, you guys have taken all this money supposedly to help with an emergency that doesn't exist and made sure that you hurt the larger number of us at the same time. That's just unconscionable. So we're just gonna keep saying it. We're gonna keep asking that Satya Ryan's letters all be read. She has written every single time since she cannot come in person because this room is so toxic and you have ignored Marilyn Garrett all these years, explaining that the overdose of EMFs in this room is not only entirely unnecessary as you sit there with computers that can easily be plugged into ethernet, but it is also the toxic atmosphere of being ignored, that we are all so totally ignored you do a nicer job of at least looking at us, Greg, and speaking to us when we say something. But the fact that our, our suggestion since March that you do all the things that Placer County has done has never gone anywhere, that's really, really horrible not just to the Indians of this county, but to all the poor, all the homeless. We find out in Placer County, they actually solved their equally huge homeless problem years ago, years ago. What have you done for all the money you've taken? Like the, uh, the overblown consent agenda item again today, consent agendas of 50 items with tens of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars that you throw into a consent vote? That's not helping the greatest number here. Walk around Placer County, you can see they have applied the monies that come from their vast majority of, of taxpayer funds for home ownership and rentals. They have applied it to the people and they have a quality of life that just goes so far beyond ours. Thank you. Uh, you have a good point. Uh, we didn't uh, want to ignore them. I, I appreciate that. I would love to hear your responses next time. You can put it on the agenda. That would be lovely. That's the job as I understand it. Thank you. Okay, okay so that uh, concludes uh, public comment. Uh, nobody on the web? There's no public comment. And uh, we, I would we'll, move we'll, the we'll uh, the uh, the recommended action. Yeah, uh, we'll take action on it. Second. Okay, we have a first and second. If you can call the roll. Supervisor Leopold. Aye. Friend. Aye. 
Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Chair Caput? Aye. The uh, motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. That takes us, uh, we'll, we'll take a 10 minute break and uh, we'll come back. So we'll be back here at uh, 10 minutes till 11. There you go. Uh, we'll start. We'll go ahead and start. Go ahead. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Good morning. Uh, Marilyn Underwood. Supervisor McPherson's here. Thank you, Supervisor. Good morning, uh, uh, Chairman Caput and Board. Uh, Marilyn Underwood, Director of Environmental Health, and I'm here to present the emergency ordinance for debris removal for the CZU fire impacted area. And I also thought I'd take the opportunity to update you on the, uh, the progress that has been made so far on the debris removal. So, um, as you know, over in August, uh, over 900 homes and uh, almost 1,500 structures were burned as part of the CZU fire. And I've, I, I had friends impacted and I've met a number of people since then. And one of the things that they really wanna do is keep, move on and rebuild. Um, and, but the first st step of that is a process involving debris removal. And I think we've all learned a lot more about what that entails and why it's so important. Um, it's so important because our, the ash, the structure within the structures of these homes and other uh, types of buildings that were burned contain a lot of different types of material that end up being toxic for our environment, for ourselves, uh, and for our watershed, our water, our drinking water quality. So they, in, in other places where they've experienced this, it's very important that a really complete uh, debris removal has taken place on these different structures. And the nice thing is that FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Association, as well as the Office of Emergency Services through the state help us do that. They've done it in other fires and other locations and are doing it again this year. So we do have a public option that I'll be describing later uh, that we hope soon will be available um, to help with that so that it's not a cost necessarily to the homeowner. So I just will say that we, um, the debris removal is underway um, and I wanted to bring light to our website, but first I also wanted to introduce, um, we've had the opportunity to hire uh, somebody to help us come deal with the de debris removal process and the paperwork involved. Uh, Louis Posabon, who's here at the podium. Uh, Louis has almost 40 years of being in environmental health uh, field and actually almost 20 years as the director of the city of Vernon environmental health department. Most of his experience is in SoCal. But more appropriate to this is he actually helped out for six months uh, back in 2017 at the Sonoma County fires, doing exactly what he's doing to helping us with here, which is again, the putting in place the debris removal process uh, okay. and, and paperwork. I'm gonna so, uh, quickly just say, uh, this is item number uh, eight, consider adoption of an urgency ordinance adding chapter 7.140 to the Santa Cruz County Code to establish a debris removal program related to the CZU August Lightning Complex fires as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of uh, Health Services. So it'll require a four, uh, four out of five vote. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Sorry. Go ahead. Good morning. Um, introduce Lewis. I'm the hired as a temporary employee uh, to uh, help manage the fire debris removal program, um, which basically encompasses a, a private contractor uh, program, the public option program, and then the exemption program, which is basically uh, people that have had uh, some minor structures and fences burned. And so they, if they need to take that material to the landfill, we're going through a process to allow them to do that. Um, also coordinating uh, monitors in the field, some environmental health staff and mutual aid staff going out into the field and uh, checking on what's being done, uh, helping residents communicate with uh, the US EPA who's doing the phase one household hazardous waste removal um, and with issues of access, lock gates, um, just different concerns that they might have. Um, gonna be busy. Uh, doing all this, uh, but it's, it's, it's really good work and I hope we'll get it done really fast. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Lewis. You're welcome. Great to have him here, certainly helpful. 
So I, I, I wanted to show that uh, we are always referring people to our website for the latest. And again, reason why is that um, it's a great way to get information out to people. Debris removal is one of the buttons that on our main fire recovery page, I will also point out the maps one. And then a new one that we're also put some important information on is the watershed protection one. So within the debris removal, the reason why I'm gonna take you there is that after this fire occurred, we did have a health officer order uh, on September 3rd that basically said, no one should get into the ash and start moving it around because it presents hazards to the environment until we put out additional orders and uh, direction about how to, to take care of the ash. This is again, ash within the structures of the buildings. Um, we also put on this website a debris removal flow chart and I'm just gonna show that because it does provide some good information about how one moves from a house or a structure and th moves through these different phases, debris one and debris removal two. I will say there, there are exempt structures. Those exempt structures are things that are 120 square feet or less and did not contain any household hazardous waste or asbestos. You can apply to us to have your facility, your shed or structure exempted. Uh, we go and take a look at it, look at pictures, and then give you a, the application back with it stamped with our approval so you can take it to a landfill. Otherwise, you're involved in this debris removal phase one. I'm gonna go back, show you that a little bit of that. Um, and that's thanks to a US EPA who has been here since the end of September. And they are out there today. Um, and they've been doing a heck of a lot of work. I think they're over, um, some, somewhere like two thirds of the way through. This is their website where they show us a map and there you can see they're in other counties as well. But if you wanna see what the progress is in our county, one of the, there's two places I would send people to, and this is one, get you a, a little closer in. So you can see these, they've broken our, our county into different zones. Zone one is in San Mateo, but zones two through 15 are in our county. And um, as you screen in, you'll see that uh, the assessment needed, the blue are where they still need to go. Uh, the yellow are where they're having access issues and we do assist with them with trying to reach out and get access. This might be a locked gate or something like that. The orange are sites where they've gone to and they've seen that for instance, there may be some standing walls or chimneys that actually endanger their workers from proceeding. So they just mark it as access, uh, something that they need to return to after they can deal with these, these uh, dangerous structures. And then green you can see is the phase one completed and quite a bit is done already. You know, they did start on the last chance area, one team and a number of teams over here in the 236 corridor uh, past Boulder Creek, uh, quite a bit of work do done over here. And now recently they moved up to the Bonnie Dune area and you can see them um, starting to do some work here in Bonnie Dune and, and working their way around Bonnie Dune. They anticipate they'll probably be here another three to four weeks, maybe sooner. Uh, but again, they'll have to clean, deal with some of these properties they don't have access to and such. The other part of their, their um, um, site I wanted to actually show you as well is this one in particular just goes and shows you some of their progressive metrics that they have. It shows you, um, let me just, takes, it's an interesting uh, approach where it kind of scrolls and then the map comes up. These are the zones they're currently working in. So you can see they still have a little work they're working in over in the uh, Boulder Creek area, up here in the um, Last Chance and uh, working their way to Wild Horse, Wild House Creek, uh, and then down here in the Bonnie Dune area. If you keep scrolling, you'll see some of their progressive metrics. Uh, and this is where they, are, they can show you that they've got 56 completed, 4% access issues, 6% return needed, and then they've about 34% uh, is still yet to, to work on phase one. And so what is phase one? Phase one is again, this part needed because our structures, these burn structures have household hazardous waste, have bulk asbestos, have other types of material that need to be removed first so that when you go back and want to remove the ash and take and the foundation and the surface soil, you can actually end up taking it to a class two or class three landfill that is allowed to take that material. They've been allowed uh, filed with Cal Recycle and been allowed to take that material. 
So that's this all what we're doing in debris phase, uh, debris removal phase one. Phase two involves two options, a private contractor option, um, and you can choose your private contractor. You file your application with us and you can, uh, we look at the work plan from the um, private contractor. It moves you through the phases. The private contractor does the work. You come back to us, you submit to us a report that says you completed the, uh, the removal. Here's your asbestos um, findings. Here's your soil sampling at the end. And then we issue you uh, a cleanup clearance so that you can move on to the next phase of your rebuilding, whether it be temporary housing or permanent housing. On the other hand, you might wanna take the, um, choose the right of entry. I think I might've indicated the wrong one. Here's the private contractor approach. Or you might wanna choose the pri uh, property and you might wanna choose the public option I'll call the government option. This we know we can offer to folks, although yet, if we do not have the details from um, the Office of Emergency Services, Cal Recycle, the state agency, and we don't have a right of entry form yet. We understand they may be providing that late this week to us. So we hope to make that available on our website and in person early next week. Uh, a person signs a right of entry saying, yes, you can come onto my property. They also disclose that they do have insurance that covers debris removal. Uh, again, there's no cost to the homeowner for this uh, option. If there's a de re debris removal clause in their insurance, they will be asked to submit that or will work with the insurance company directly to, to uh, get that part of the insurance. But I will also say it's very important if they all have costs incurred themselves, say that they need to do some tree removal, that's not gonna necessarily be part of the phase two government option. They can do that tree removal, save their receipt, and that would be taken out first before uh, the government would come back for the other part of their insurance uh, the, for debris removal. So again, it's, it's really that in most cases, uh, the cost to the, the homeowner for debris removal should be taken out first before the government would be looking for the other part. And if you don't have insurance, it is no cost to you to engage in the government option. Um, I want to go back to, uh, let me just see how I can navigate back to, here we go. So this information is updated. We try to keep it updated all the time on uh, phase one and phase two. Here is nice fact sheet from EPA about phase one so people can get some information. There's also a, for, a hotline that they can uh, communicate with EPA. Uh, and otherwise uh, we did last week put up the option for phase two. Uh, for the private contractor option. And I will say as of this morning, we had, um, let's see, 11 private um, applications for the private owner uh, approach and we have approved nine so they can go forward. Again, we would not approve the work plan and the application until we know phase one is done. So we do know at least in nine properties, they will be moving on to phase uh, two uh, private cleanup. The other thing that we have here as well is we have the exemption information. So again, if somebody thinks they have a structure 120 square feet or less, does not contain anything hazardous, they can apply to have uh, that material be part of the, their parcel, be part of the exemption program. Uh, and at this point, we've received 13 exemptions. We go out and verify, and we have 10 accepted to move forward with that part. So we anticipate, obviously, these are fairly new. We will be reaching out to people and making sure they're aware that these options are available. Uh, and we hope soon to make the public option um, available. Let me just pause there to make sure I didn't wanna say anything else on the, again, we're really trying to emphasize coming here because we keep it updated. And one small plug, I know the greatest thing too is a lot of people are concerned about this debris removal and moving forward with the public option because they are concerned about their watershed, our watershed. And I will say one of the great documents that was put together recently with a combined effort with resource recovery uh, district and um, folks in public works and, and on my office were this uh, post fire watershed recovery guide, which is under available under our watershed protection button here on uh, the home uh, on the fire recovery page. So what you have before you, I think I've covered most of the things I wanted to kind of touch on is an emergency ordinance that would sort of um, put in place the requirement that people participate in either this public or private option. 
And again, the public, the, the public option for those that don't have insurance would be free of charge to them. So we would make a very concerted effort to make sure people are aware they need to be part of the public option if they don't wanna do, do a private contractor option. But ultimately there will be a deadline by which they have to apply for this public option or the private contractor option. And if they miss that, despite all of our efforts, then we under per this emergency ordinance will be able to clean it up and charge them charge their property for the cleanup costs. So that's what you have before you. Again, our um, desire is to make every effort to make sure people know about the, the requirement and get them involved in a private contract or a public option before uh, that deadline exists and that deadline comes to happen. But it does allow us to take this additional step. And with that, I think I will take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, you have any uh, questions or comments? Well, I guess I just want to start by thanking Dr. Underwood uh, for her responsiveness and her work. As she mentioned, uh, this uh, debris removal is the first step towards rebuilding and it's um, and then also preventing uh, more significant debris flows. Uh, her office and her, she have been incredibly responsive uh, to members of the community. I know uh, everyone wants this to be happen faster, um, but I appreciate how we've been working t diligently. The teams have been out there and then we're creating a path for people uh, for phase two um, to either partner uh, and a public option or do their private option. And um, the fact that we already have applications in and people already moving forward, uh, I think is a good sign. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, uh, Ms. Underwood for your presentation. I, I know um, we all should know that without this cleanup operation we'd have an environmental hazard nightmare throughout santa cruz county in our watersheds and i know there's been a lot of frustration you've heard it i've heard it people wanting to get going uh but uh you've explained the government and the private options and i know that some people have been uh anxious to get going uh and uh, i hope they can they can move ahead as uh, we get this uh completed uh, I think the Office of Emergency Services in the state and FEMA and the federal level uh, should be thanked for being our partners. Uh, we've really worked well together with them uh, to coordinate this recovery effort. Um, and it, it's reassuring that to know that we have good partners that we can communicate work and work well with uh, as we go through this together. I also want to thank our state and federal elected officials for their efforts to advocate for resources being brought to Santa Cruz County to respond to these fires. Um, there's been a great deal of confusion from property owners, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, affected by the fire. So I, um, I really appreciate the environmental health staff for updating our website and to make the detailed information available. It's gonna be very important as we move ahead. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the, uh, the the timing of the Cal OES uh, phase two operations and, and when can we expect, the, uh, and maybe you had mentioned some timelines here, uh, the pub, uh, can the public expect uh, regarding when phase two public operations will begin? It seems like it'd be about in three, uh, two to th or three to four weeks. Yes, Supervisor McPherson, my understanding is uh, that we would anticipate about a month delay and then actually getting into the field. So I'm I'm kind of hoping like mid November, but I to be honest with you, I haven't heard that. That's just my understanding from various folks that that's kind of the the delay in getting out there. Uh, and um, where are we at in getting additional resources to clean up the burned vehicles and as part of phase two? I don't know if they just said no overall and you don't don't apply again, or is there a chance that we might be able to get some uh, funding resources for uh, burned vehicles? Supervisor McPherson, Nicole Coburn, um, we are advocating with the state to try and get assistance through the California Disaster Assistance Act to help with the vehicle cleanup and other structures that weren't included in the phase two approval. So we are, we are still advocating for that and we are hopeful that the state will be assisting us. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. 
Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I have no questions, but I just wanna express my appreciation for the hard work that I know that you're doing in environmental health to address the needs of so many people. I'm glad to have uh, extra help on board uh, to, to, to help with this really critical part of the rebuilding process. And um, I, I, I agree that it's an urgency that we should get this done. And I look forward to supporting the resolution. Okay, uh, and then uh, Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation and for the thoughtfulness and thoroughness that you've put into this uh, recovery effort. Um, I know that you and um, our county's PIO have been working on communications around this, but, uh, but it just reemphasized to me, again, listening to your presentation, the need to really ensure that the communities up there are aware of everything that's going on. I know that Supervisor McPherson and Supervisor Coonerty have also been doing communication, but for people that have been displaced, uh, traditional means aren't always the easiest way to reach people. So uh, I just wanna double down on the, the emphasis on ensuring that we're trying everything possible to just make sure that this information is broadcast as widely as possible. Thank you again for your leadership on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I just like to say this is a huge uh, uh, undertaking. Uh, uh, we're talking about tons and huge trucks, uh, the belly loaders, uh, removing uh, debris. And uh, uh, it's, uh, do we have any estimate? Uh, we, we don't have an estimate how many truckloads are going to be going back and forth. Uh, yet, I, I know it's- uh, uh, I do not, although I have to say Caltrans is very much involved in our debris task force meetings across that we do across the state. So I know somebody's thinking about that. Yeah, you yeah. bet. I, I know when we had the bench excavation for the Pajaro River, there was 30,000 truckloads, uh, uh, 10 tons per uh, truckload uh, going in and out of Watsonville area. So uh, the traffic's gonna be, uh, we're gonna be seeing those trucks. Uh, the only other thing I could say is that uh, we're not out of the trouble yet. Uh, it's still dry. Uh, we think we're, you know, kind of relaxed a little bit because the fires are out, but uh, we haven't had rain yet. And uh, October, it can be a very uh, dangerous time. So I think uh, we're watching that real close. And uh, we don't know, uh, we don't have a, uh, ballpark estimate on the final cost of all this. Uh, I do not. Yeah, no, we don't. I'm sure. Uh, the last thing is, uh, it's gonna. The debris is gonna go to uh, how many different landfills? Um, the private contractor can choose the landfills. We've identified for them some of the costs that for either Ox Mountain and San Mateo. Uh, City of Santa Cruz resource recovery is going to be fairly limited on what they want to accept just because of their um, the size of their landfill, not wanting to fill it up. Buena Vista is um, going to be allowing it, but again, they can't take large trucks. And then lastly, we pointing people to uh, the one Monterey regional waste disposal in Marina as another one. They could take it to other locations. Those are the ones we've directly uh, corresponded with. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, open it up to the public for public uh, questions or comments. Chair, we have one web comment and it comes from Jessica Peters. Dear Board of Supervisors, our community is filled with good people who want to do the best for their families and neighbors. Please consider a collaborative approach to help people navigate this difficult process. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll uh, close the uh, public hearing and uh, we'll uh, have a vote. It does require four out of five uh, minimum. I would move the recommended actions. Okay. Second. We have a first and second. Please call the roll. Supervisor Leopold. Aye. A friend. I'm sorry. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Chair Caput. Aye, it passes unanimously. And thank you very much and uh, take care. We'll go uh, item number nine, consider final reappointment of Lagaya Elegio uh, to the Housing Authority Board of Commissioners as an at-large tenant representative 
for a term to expire October 18, 2022. The I move nomination approval. was accepted on October 6, 2020. I move approval. Okay. Second. Second. Uh, okay, I think uh, it was Coonerty. Second, okay. I'll call for a vote then. Yep. Just to note, there's no, there's, there are no members of the public in the chambers. <laughs> there is no public comment, correct. Okay, so Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Chair Caput? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Um, item number 10, consider final appointment, appointment of Teresa M. Carino to the Commission on Justice and Gender as an at-large survivor representative for a term to expire April 1st, 2024. Nomination was accepted October 6, 2020. Board members have any questions or comments? I would move approval. Uh, any public comments or questions? There is no public comment and there are no web comments. Okay, okay, thank you. And we do have a motion by Supervisor uh, Leopold. We have a second. Second. We have a second by Supervisor Friend, I believe. Uh, that concludes. Uh, Take a vote. Uh, I we're vote. ready for a motion and a vote. <laughs> okay, I'll call for a vote. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Chair Caput? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Um, item number 11 is closed session. Uh, council, will there be any reportable, reportable uh, items from closed session? No, there's nothing reportable from closed session. And then at 7 p.m. tonight, the board will convene as the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 7 Board of Directors to conduct a special meeting. Uh, it's gonna be uh, virtual? Yes. Yeah, it'll be virtual, okay. I would like to correct that. Oh. Um, we The chambers will be open for people to come and comment. There, we. They will not be able to call in. They will have to come to the chambers tonight and they will be open. Okay. I'll be able to do this out of my office. Uh, to my up. understanding, all supervisors will be attending through teams. Okay, thank you. And the next regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors is scheduled for 9 a.m. Tuesday, November 10th, 2020. Thank you. Thank you.